Hey everybody, this week we're going to start chapter 3, and in chapter 3 we are going to look at simple regression. Now, you're probably thinking we already did simple regression. We did it a couple of weeks ago, and you're right. And uh, what you're going to find in this course, though, is that we tend to go over the material in successive layers. So we did a simple introduction to simple regression, but remember we left a lot of the formulas out and we left some of the underlying principles out. This week, starting this week, we go back through them again. We'll, we're going to add in some more of the theoretical detail behind them. So hopefully you've already got some intuition about what regression is doing. Now we begin to add some of the theory to it. And um, make sure you're keeping up with the readings make sure you're keeping up with the R programming and the assignments. And if you're running into any trouble, be sure to let one of us know and we'll be glad to help you. So on to chapter three, grab your pens and let's go. Here we go. Um, we are going to talk about probability, first of all. Um, now, the chapter introduces the idea of a random variable, and then says, if you're curious about what a random variable is, if you want to know what the definition is, you can look in the appendix it's, uh, at the back of the book. So let's take a look. Um, Appendix B. Here we go, and I think it's right at the beginning of Appendix B. Um, definition B3. Here we are. Uh, let me zoom in for you. Definition B3. Random variables and probability. Um, okay, this is relating to probability. Experiments are represented by a variable. Since the outcome of an experiment is not known in an advance such a variable is known as a random variable the precise definition and interpretation of probability are sources of dispute all right so here's the fun thing um if you uh if you spend some time digging into the uh, theory of statistics you end up realizing that the definition of a random variable is a variable that's random and that's about all we can really do with it um and uh, so we're not actually going to, uh, that's not your eyesight, by the way. I just hit the autofocus button to try to clear that up. Um, we can't really define this all that precisely, but here's one way of looking at it. If we call X a random variable, what that means is X stands for a whole range of possible values. So X can take a whole range of values and at any one time it might take a specific value so um, if we say x1 that's called a specific realization realization of x so um, if you have uh, a dice, for instance, in a board game, um, X might be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So it can take one of those values. And uh, the probability of each one of these would be 1 over 6, if it's a proper dice. So what we have with a random variable is the set of values that it can take, and the probabilities associated with each of those values. Now, if we graph this, what we would have is, let's say, x, so there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then on the vertical axis, we're going to put the probability. <coughs> and the 
it's always the same. It's 1 over 6. Okay, so then if we draw the graph, it's just going to be 1 over 6 every time. So that's a very simple example of that's a probability distribution. Probability oops, distribution. So you've got the range of possible values, and here you've got the probability associated with each one. <clears throat> now, many of the variables that we're interested in, they um, they can. It's not just six possible values. There might it might be a continuous function. So this is a a discrete random variable. Discrete meaning it can only take a, a countable number of values. But if it's a continuous random variable, then we couldn't graph it in the same way. So let's say uh, if x is a continuous random variable. Did I spell that? No. Continue. And there's another u there. Continuous random variable. Um, so, for example, house price. <clears throat> um, then uh, the graph of the probability distribution will look a little different. So, um, let's say X in a particular city, um, well, it could be zero all the way up to, let's say, two million. Um, and most of the houses that we observe would be in some kind of a range. So uh, that's one million there. So most of them are going to be in a range from, say, uh, 300,000 up to a million. And... Uh, very few of them will be down at this lower price, and very few of them will be up there. But as we um, go towards the average house value, we'll get more and more of the sample located there, and so we represent that um, with this distribution curve. And so the height of the curve here is going to be an indicator of how much of the sample is located or how much of the population, in the case of uh, population distribution, how much of the population is, is located uh, over there. Um, now, there might be tails that go a long way, but um, very little data is out here. Um, so this is um, a prob... Uh, Ability density. Function. <clears throat> and uh, the way we interpret the probability density function, so it's, it's different here. So, uh, I'm sure you guys spotted this. Probability. Probability. If I had more um, vanity, I would stop the video now, redo the whole thing, and, and not make that mistake, but uh, um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, okay, so uh, where was I? Yes, uh, here, if you, um, you want to know what's the uh, probability of rolling a 3 on the dice, well, it's just the height of the graph when it's a discrete distribution like this. But here, if you want to know what's the probability of a house that's worth being worth exactly 400,000, it is not the height of the graph. Okay, it's a different interpretation. In this case, well, I, you know, I'll come back to that. All we can ever do here is look over a range of values because remember, this is a continuous distribution. So, Instead, what we would do is we would say, well, we're going to define a range. It'll be a little above 400,000 uh, to a little bit below, a little below to a little bit above. And then that defines an area under the distribution function. And uh, so the area, 
will be the probability that x falls in this range. Let me put this on a bigger picture over here. So this is our distribution. This is our random variable x. And we have a probability density function like this. Might be bell-shaped. Might have a different shape, but we'll go with bell-shaped for now. And we're interested in what's the probability that x falls in this range of values. And um, so I'll call it lowercase x1 and lowercase x2. Now, the area under the PDF, so PDF means probability density function. The area under the PDF equals 1, the whole thing. Uh, from the lowest possible value of x to the maximum possible value of x. The probability that x falls in this range between x1 and x2 will equal the area that I've just shaded in. So this area under the curve between these two values. And that um, probability will be less than 1. So then um, the probability that x falls between x1 and x2 equals area under the PDF between x1 and x2. Um, and what we're going to be learning in this lecture today is how to do those calculations using tables in the statistical textbook. So um, before we get to that, I just want to fill in a little bit more information about the nature of random variables and of distributions. Now, uh, when we draw a normal or a, when, we, when we draw a density function, um, and let's say it's a bell-shaped function, um, the shape is going to be determined by a couple of parameters. So the shape of the normal probability density function is determined by two parameters. Mu, or the expected value, say the mean, and sigma squared, which is the variance. And we've already talked about what the mean and the variance uh, are for population and for sample. Uh, oh, one point I, I meant to make at the beginning. Notation-wise, if I'm talking about a sample of observations on x, then they're going to have subscripts. So it'll be x1 through to xn. Okay, so that's the sample of observations or realizations of x. If I want to talk about x in general as the random variable, uh, I can write it without the subscripts. Okay, so this is just the random variable x. So if when we get to um, talking about regression models, since we'll have random variables in the regression models. Um, if I want to emphasize that I'm talking about a, a point in the data set, then I'll use subscripts. But sometimes if I want to emphasize that I'm just talking about the, the random variables, then uh, I might leave the subscripts off. But that's the difference between the two. The X without a subscript, uh, if it's a random variable, then that means it could take on any one of many values. And uh, we use a subscript to show the realizations of the random variable. 
Okay, so um, let's uh, use the variable name y, and uh, we're going to look at the case where y is distributed as a normal random variable. y is distributed as a normal or Gaussian is another term. Um, normal random variable. So that um, does not mean normal in the colloquial sense of everything tends to look like this. Um, uh, the Gaussian distribution, it's a specific mathematical function that looks like that. Uh, it's called normal because there are a lot of processes that follow a normal random variable, but um, it doesn't have to be um, normal in the way that you would use the term. So, um, for instance, um, if you have uh, observations on, I don't know, let's say you uh, work in a company that makes shoes and you're collecting data on the shoes as they come out of the assembly line and there are some shoes that come out normally the way they're supposed to and then there are some that come out abnormally there's some defect in them well it may be that the abnormal shoe defects follow a normal distribution there's nothing contradictory about that and we wouldn't call that an abnormal distribution we would say that it's the um, normal distribution of the abnormal defects in the shoes so normal distribution, the short form is n, uh, different from sample size, by the way. It should be clear in the context of what we're talking about. And then we'll refer to the mean and the variance. So um, this is shorthand for normal random, uh, normal distribution with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. All right, let me just write that down. Normal distribution. with mean, mu, and the variance, sigma squared. Now, it is a feature of the normal distribution that mu is located where the density function hits a peak. Um, so it's telling you where the center of the distribution is. And then the variance is telling you how widely spread out it is. So if you have a random variable, a normal random variable with a mean of mu and a very tiny variance, then it means almost all of the density is piled up right in the middle. All right, so this would be a low value of sigma squared, low. And this is a high sigma squared, or high variance. So the higher the variance, the more flattened and spread out is the uh, density function. Um, so our short form for this sentence here would be y is distributed normally with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. As long as we know mu and sigma squared, then we know the uh, shape of the distribution function. Um, and just tying it all back to regression, do I need to leave that for a moment? Well, you can freeze the, you can pause if you need. Um, okay, tying it back to regression. Regression model. And so in this class, we're, in this lecture, we're going to use the simplest possible regression model. So it's going to be y equals x beta plus epsilon. And here we are talking about a specific data set, so I'm going to put subscripts on. Um, our assumption is going to be that the error terms come from a random distribution. They have a distribution. So Epsilon here is a random variable. 
and we're going to assume that x is not a random variable, which may or may not be a good assumption, but we're going to make that assumption all through the course and um, until the end. We'll look at what happens if that's not true. But for now, we're going to assume it's not a random variable. So um, we got a um, random variable and a non-random variable. And if you add those two together, y has to be a random variable. OK, so y inherits the randomness of the error term. And the fact that this is not a random variable doesn't cancel it out. So it's generally true that a function of a random variable is itself a random variable. Uh, that's a, um, an important result in statistics. So um, no matter how big and complicated the function is, this is a pretty simple function, but no matter how complicated the function is, if it's a function of a random variable, the result is itself a random variable. Okay, now when we um, find our estimate of what beta is, so this is the uh, least squares estimate of beta. Well, it's going to be a function of the x's and the y's. So it's going to be based on the data set that we have. It's a function of the x's and y's. So it is a function. Now we'll see what the formula is in a little bit. Function of x, i, and y, i. Therefore, beta hat is a random variable. And that means beta hat has a distribution. So then we're going to be interested in making probability statements about, well, what's the probability that the true value of beta would be in a range over here, given the fact that the estimate of beta hat is over here. So that's, um, that's going to be uh, a, an important application of this. Um, so in our um, regression model then, what we're doing is uh, taking the data x and y, the observations on x and y, and we're estimating um, beta. The, our underlying assumption is that the true value of beta is not random. But the estimate is random. All right, so the, um, the true value is not random, but we don't know what it is. We don't know the true value of beta. Um, but the estimate, ah, oh, sorry, that's a mess. Estimate beta hat is a random variable. All right. Um, so, uh, uh, that's an E at the beginning, estimate. Um, so I have to keep this distinction in mind. So when I write beta hat, I'm talking about the least squares estimate of beta, the underlying true value. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's some preliminary stuff. Now let's talk about how to use the standard normal tables to calculate probabilities. So before we start using the tables to calculate probabilities, we need to understand something called the Z-transform. So um, we are going to rem uh, remember that the expected value of Y, uh, that's what we denote by mu. Um, the, sometimes I'll call it the mean, and you might notice when I do that, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant about calling it the mean. Um, I should really call it the expected value. Um, the mean is equal to the expected value, uh, but it's um, the mean. You usually think of that as the unweighted average, and um, so I'm. I have to be careful because uh, sometimes the mean, the average, and expected value are all the same if every outcome has exactly the same probability. 
but if you have a distribution where some outcomes are weighted more heavily, then the um, the mean and the expected value they're the same thing as long as you're using a function for the mean that corresponds to the expected value. Um, but there are lots of formulas for the mean and there are lots of formulas for the average and they don't always correspond to the expected value. So that's, uh, you notice sometimes I'm a little hesitant about what to call this. I'm going to call it the mean on the assumption in this course that um, the expected value is the appropriate formula to use and you remember that the expected value um, it is the sum of all the possible outcomes times the probability of that outcome. So if it's a discrete variable, discrete random variable, then the expected value equals the sum of all the possible values of y times the probability that y equals that value. Okay, um, if it's continuous, then the expected value of y is an integral. So it'll be the integral from the minimum to the maximum value of y times, and then whatever, whatever we're calling the density function, but um, it would be something like f of y. where that is the PDF. Um, so that is the notation that we're using. We won't typically use the notation of integrals. We'll just talk about areas under curves. But um, if you want, that's what the, the formal definition looks like. So uh, expected value of y, we call that mu. And the variance of y, we call it sigma squared. Um, and there's something called a Z-transform. The Z-transform arises if you subtract the mean and divide by the square root of the variance. Subtract the mean, divide by the square root of variance. Why is this useful? Well, let's look at the expected value of Z. So that is the expected value of Y minus mu over sigma. Now, um, we've done some practicing with um, linear transformations of, of expectations. So, um, since these are parameters, they're non-random, so we can take them outside of the expected value. So that we'll start with 1 over sigma times the expected value of y minus mu. And then this is the random variable. This is a constant. Mu is a constant. It's not a random variable. It's a parameter, so this equals 1 over sigma expected value of y minus um, mu. Okay, but the expected value of y equals mu, so that has to equal 0 because the expected value of y equals mu. Okay, so that so the expected value of z equals zero, um, and then uh, I do this. I have a bit of extra paper. Um, the variance of z, well, that's the variance of y minus mu over sigma. Um, so we'll take the uh, sigma outside and. Um, so we have 1 over sigma squared. Um, and you remember, when we take constant outside of the variance operator, we square it. So that's why this is 1 over sigma squared. So that's um, 1 over sigma squared times the variance of y minus mu. And you'll remember that when you add or subtract a constant to the number inside the variance operator, it doesn't change the variance. So that is going to be the same as 1 over sigma squared times the variance of y. And um, hopefully both those steps are, are familiar to you now. 
Um, so this is 1 over sigma squared times. Now the variance of y is sigma squared. So these two cancel out, and we have 1. So the uh, important thing about this transformation is regardless of what mu and sigma are, uh, z is distributed n0, 1. So regardless of what mu and sigma squared are. And that's useful because we're going to want to calculate some probabilities about distributions that have all kinds of different means and variances. Now, we don't have tables for them all, but we do have tables for uh, N01, which is called the standard normal. All right, so let me give you an example. Let's work through an example. Um, so let's start with an example with the standard normal table. Compute the probability that z is less than or equal to 0 0.25 when z is distributed in 0, 1. Okay, so... Um, when you do these kinds of calculations, it's always helpful to draw a picture. I highly recommend drawing a picture. All right, so the standard normal has a mean at zero, and then it's the bell-shaped distribution, like so. Um, and we want to know what is the probability that z is less than or equal to 0 0.25. Okay, so it's the whole distribution up to 0 0.25. Um, now, these don't actually ever meet the horizontal axis. They get very, very close. But in principle, a normal distribution, normally distributed variable, could go to infinity in either direction. So we don't ever draw this as hitting the horizontal axis. But... Um, the numbers get so small once you're a few standard deviations out that they don't really matter. Um, okay, it's a symmetric distribution, and remember the probability under the whole or the area under the whole thing is one, so the uh, area under half of it is one half. So the probability that z is less than or equal to zero equals zero point five. And so we're going to get an answer that's 0 0.5 plus this area here. So that area is the probability that 0 is less than or equal to... Uh, oh, sorry. That, yes. 0 less than or equal to Z, which is less than or equal to 0 0.25. Probability that Z is between 0 and 0 0.25. Now, um, in the textbook, at the back we have a bunch of probability tables. And the first one is the uh, standard normal table. Let me zoom in here. Um, and you'll see that it's the area under the standard normal distribution. Um, uh, you can't really see that because it's uh, kind of blurry. But what that says is between, um, between 0 and and the value that we're interested in. Uh, you, you can look in your own textbook, but take my word for it. That is the probability from zero uh, up to the value we're interested in. So that it is always looking at this area here. From zero up to some positive number. Okay, so in this case, we're interested in the probability that Z falls between 0 and 0 0.25. Okay, so the way we're going to read the table is... Um, let me see if I can sharpen this up a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that helps. So the number 0 0.25, that's what's referred to here as little Z, little scripted Z. And... Um, 
So you start by reading down the column to get the first digit in Z, and that's 0 0.2. And then we read across the column to get the second digit in Z, and so it's 0 0.05. So um, this number here, so we're looking at 0 0.0987 is the entry in the table there. 0 0.0987. That is the probability that Z falls between 0 and 0 0.25. So what did I say that was? Um, 0 0.25, 0 0.0987. 0.0987. Okay, so the probability... I'll back out a bit here. The probability that Z is less than or equal to 0 0.25 equals the probability that... Z is less than or equal to 0, plus the probability that 0 is less than or equal to Z, which is less than or equal to 0 0.25. And so we've, we've just broken this area up into its two parts. The part below 0, and then the part between 0 and 0 0.25. And so that equals 0 0.5, that's that part plus 0 0.0987, so the answer is 0 0.5987. Okay, um, let's do another example. Suppose, um, uh, actually, let's do. Let's start with a simple example. Again, we'll we'll use the tables. So, um, I want you to compute the probability that zero is less than or equal to z, which is less than or equal to one point nine six. Okay. So, let's pause here for a second and use the table and see if you can figure out um, the probability that a standard normal random variable falls in the interval between 0 and 1.96. All right, so here's the end. Let's, let's get the book. Go to the back, open up the table. <clears throat> so, um, and remember with Z, the little scripted Z, um, the first part is 1.9, and then the second part is the 0.06. So we go down here, down this column to, there we are, 1.9, and now we're going to read across the row to 0 0.06. 0 0.06, all right, so that's 0 0.475. point four seven five. Um, so if we draw a picture of that, this area zero point four seven five. Um, and because it's symmetric, if we go the same distance in the other direction, minus 1.96, well, that will also be 0 0.475. So, um, uh, what do those add up? Um, 0 0.475 plus 0 0.475 equals 0 0.95. So 95% of the standard normal distribution falls in the interval from minus 1.96 to plus 1.96. Now you'll remember that um, so that the standard normal is n oops n01 um, mean of zero variance of one. Standard deviation is also 1. So we could measure out in standard deviation units on the horizontal axis here. So 
So that would be one standard deviation. And then this is almost two standard deviations. So just below two standard deviations. So that's why I was able to say back a couple of lectures ago that if you go two standard deviations on either side of the mean and it's a normal random variable, you now encompass 95% of the distribution. And again, that works for the normal distribution. And a lot of things are distributed normally, so it works in a lot of cases. All right, let's do a slightly more complicated example. Uh, we will say the expected value of y equals 1. And remember, that's mu. And the variance of y equals 9. And we want to calculate the probability that y is less than or equal to 1.75. Okay, well, um, we don't have tables for the normal distribution with the um, mean of 1 and a variance of 9. So we're going to have to use a Z transform to get this one. So pause here, do the Z transform, see uh, if you can at least get it set up and get started, and then we'll work through. Okay, this is okay. This is how we're going to do it. Um, so probability that y is less than or equal to one point seven five. Well, that will be equal to. Now, here's the thing. Here's where the trick is. You can apply the z transform to the y as long as you apply the same steps to the one point seven five. So we're going to say the probability that y minus mu less than or equal to 1.75 minus mu, which is 1. And that's equal to the probability y minus mu over sigma. We're going to divide by sigma. And we can do that as long as we do the same thing on the right-hand side. So that's 1.75 minus 1 divided by the square root of the variance. So that's 3. And so that is the probability that z, because we've, that's the z transform, is less than or equal to 1.75 minus 1, that's 0.75 divided by 3, so that's 0.25. Okay, so probability that z is less than or equal to 0.25. Wait a second. <clears throat> Where did I have that? Um, I'm sure I know the answer. Well, I've got it somewhere. Oh, there it is. Probability that Z is less than or equal to 0.25. Well, we figured that out already. 0.5987. Okay, so uh, chances are when you looked at this question, you didn't realize you already knew the answer to that. But um, once you apply the Z transform, then you're just w into a position where you're working with standard normals. Okay, let's do another calculation now with the Z-transform, and uh, we'll do another two-parter here. So it'll be the probability uh, minus 0 0.04 is less than or equal to Z, less than or equal to 1.49. So we have to break this one into two parts. And again, draw a picture. Makes everything easier if you draw a picture. So we have our z-score, which is distributed with a mean of 0. We're going to look at the area um, between 0 and minus 0 0.04. Sorry, that's kind of tiny and munched up there, but uh, that's the area down there. And then on the right side, the area under the curve between 0 and 1.49, and that's this part. So it's the sum of those two. Now when we use the tables we don't have date we don't have measures for the probability uh, from a minus number up to zero but it's a symmetric distribution so you can picture just flipping it around the zero line and so 
this first part is um, the probability that minus 0 0.04 is less than or equal to z less than or equal to 0 equals the probability that 0 is less than or equal to z is less than or equal to 0 0.04. Okay, that's because it's a symmetric curve around 0. Okay, so then going back to our original problem, the probability that minus 0 0.04 less than or equal to z, less than or equal to 1.49, equals these two parts. Probability that 0 is less than or equal to z, which is less than or equal to 0 0.04, plus probability that 0 is less than or equal to z, which is less than or equal to 1.49. Okay, so we put it in these forms because now these are in the form of the entries in the table. Why don't you pause here for a second, actually, see if you can look up these entries in the table. Now, if you're back, um, let's see how you did. Um, probability that 0 is less than z, which is less than 0 0.04. So we are in the first row, the very top row, and we go across to 0 0.04, and that is... 0 0.0160. So that is 0 0.0160 plus, and then we want the probability up to 1.49. So we go down the first column here to 1.4, and then we go across here for the second decimal place, and it takes us all the way over to the end. That's 0.4319. Okay, so that's 0 0.4319. And you add those two together, and it is 0 0.4479. Okay, so that is um, the area under the curve between minus 0 0.04 and 1.49, and it's the probability that Z falls in that interval if Z follows the standard normal distribution. Um, so in the labs, you get lots of practice doing this. You got a whole bunch of exercises to do in calculating these probabilities. I, uh, even though I realize that the computer will do this for you anytime it really counts. So um, when you do regressions, basically the computer calculates all these areas that you need. But I still want you to work through all these examples and understand how it's how it's working because. It's really important for you to have the intuition of probability distributions and what we're doing with them when we uh, when we work with regression models. So this is how help build up your understanding of the theoretical underpinnings of what we're doing. Now, um, this is the standard normal. Um, there is a bunch of other distributions that we'll encounter. And they're all based on taking a variable that follows a standard normal and applying a function to it. So um, let's say that uh, z follows the standard normal. And let's form a new variable. And it's going to be z squared. Well, this is a random number. and um, uh, But it no longer follows the standard normal. This... Um, is distributed, so it follows the chi-squared distribution. And um, we could also take um, a bunch of uh, standard normals. So let's say Z1 is distributed standard normal, and Z2 is distributed standard normal, all the way down to Zn is distributed standard normal. And then if we take um, V equals Z1 squared plus Z2 squared plus all the way up to Zn squared, that's also a chi-squared distribution. But we say that it has, um, with 
N, what do we call that? So it's N underlying components to it, or N independent um, pieces of random information. The term that we use is with N degrees of freedom. Um, this concept, the degrees of freedom, this is very important in statistical modeling. It's a bit of an odd term. Um, we'll, we'll understand more towards the end of the course why we call it the degrees of freedom. <clears throat> but the, uh, uh, the essential understanding is um, the number of independent pieces of information that you're working with. Um, and so in a sample, um, it's the number of observations you have, unless there's some restriction. So um, once you start calculating things like the mean and your variance, um, if you calculate the variance, that also uses the mean. So you've got all the um, uh, all the digits in the sample, the sample size, and you've also got the mean. The mean has to equal a certain number. So that means um, you have to constrain at least one of the values in the sample if you're going to get the right mean. So then we would say you have n minus 1 degrees of freedom as far as pieces of independent information. <clears throat> so we'll, uh, we'll see that kind of thing as we go along. Now this, the chi-square distribution is important because look at what we've done here. We've taken the sum of some squared terms. All right. So if, these, if you think of these as being error terms in a regression, if they follow a standard normal, well, that's the sum of the squared errors. So uh, that's going to connect to the distribution of some of the statistics that we calculate in regression models. Um, another one, let's say um, we have Z is distributed standard normal, and V is distributed chi-squared with n degrees of freedom, df just stands for degrees of freedom, um, then if we do this, z divided by the square root of v over n. <coughs> um, that also, that's a random number, it's a random number because it's a function of underlying random numbers, and it follows something called the t-distribution with n degrees of freedom. T distribution with n degrees of freedom. Um, and so we can call that T with the subscript n. Now why would we do that? Well, you'll see. We'll get to the T statistics very soon. But um, notice that underneath here we've got some of the squared terms divided by n. That's kind of like a variance. And then we take the square root of it, and so that's kind of like a standard deviation. So um, that ratio of z to a chi-squared, the square root of a chi-squared, uh, that'll come up. Um, and then one more that we will use is, um, let's say that u um, is distributed chi-squared with m degrees of freedom, and v is distributed chi-squared with n degrees of freedom, and u and v are independent, okay, meaning the um, correlation has an expected value of zero, then if we take u over m and divide it by v over n, and we call that statistic f, um, then f is follows what's called the f distribution, and the f distribution has uh, two degrees of freedom parameters, m and n. Um, and uh, f statistics are also very important. So we will shortly be seeing how f statistics can be used in a lot of regression applications. Um, the, there isn't any particular reason why 
um, it's chi squared divided by its degrees of freedom in a fraction with another chi squared divided by its degrees of freedom. I don't expect that to intuitively mean a whole lot to you, um, but you'll see when we uh, get to testing um, hypotheses about the regression model that F statistics themselves are very useful. We, we like to generate F statistics and then there are tables that you can use for calculating probabilities. So that is it for now. Um, what we're going to do next time is uh, um, let's look forward to my notes. Um, we're going to uh, just, uh, wonder if I should, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wrap it up. But if you want me to work through another example or two, just stay tuned. Um, and uh, otherwise, what we will do in our, our next lectures, we'll start looking at what are called the classical assumptions. And the classical assumptions are the ways in which we um, connect the properties of the error term, the, the random error term, to the least squares estimates of our slope coefficients. So, and the very important, basically we'll spend the rest of the course on the classical assumptions, but we'll introduce them uh, in, uh, in a minute, or sorry, in, uh, in the next lecture. What I'm going to do now is go through a couple more examples. So, um, if you don't want to go through them, then you can uh, then we will see you next time. Otherwise, stick around. All right, here's uh, another example. Um, this time we're going to start with uh, uh, a non-standard normal. Use a Z-transform, convert it into a standard normal. All right, so we are going to look at Y, and we'll say it's distributed with a mean of 1.5 and a variance of 4.0. And... Um, we want to know what is the probability that y is greater than or equal to 0 0.5. All right, so if we draw a picture, so it's a normal, so the, uh, the mean is 1.5, so that's the center of our distribution. And we are looking at the probability that it's from 0 0.5 so right away you can see that's going to be greater than 0.5. It's going to be 0 0.5 plus whatever this area is here. Um, but we can't calculate that area because we don't have tables for um, n 1.5, 4.0. So we do the z-transform like this. The probability that y is greater than or equal to 0 0.5 equals probability that y minus mu over sigma is greater than or equal to 0 0.5 minus, okay, what do I put here? Minus 1.5 divided by, don't put 4 down, we take the square root of that, divided by 2.0. So that's the probability that z is greater than or equal to 0 0.5 minus 1.5, so that's minus 1 over 2. So that's the probability that z is greater than or equal to minus 0 0.5. Okay, so um, now if we draw the standard normal case, we have a mean here at 0, we're at minus 0 0.5. Um, so is that section plus that section. And that one is 0 0.5, okay, because it's half the distribution. And this one, you can look that one up in the table, but that is the probability the 0 is less than or equal to z, which is less than or equal to 0 0.5. Um, so that's the number in the tables that you're looking for. And that equals 0 0.1915. Okay, so that means the probability uh, that um, Z, Z there, uh, is greater than or equal to minus 0 0.5 equals 
probability that minus 0 0.5 is less than or equal to z less than or equal to 0 plus probability that z is greater than or equal to 0. And that is the probability that 0 is less than or equal to z is less than or equal to 0 0.5 plus uh, that one. Well, we know that's 0 0.5. The equivalence of this and this, that's because of the symmetry of the function. So that is 0 0.1915 plus 0 0.5, and that's 0 0.6915. Um, then using the same values, um, let's calculate the probability that 0 is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 1.0. Okay, what's the probability that y falls between 0 and 1? Given mu equals 1.5 and sigma squared equals 4.0. Alright, so you know what we do now. Probability that um, 0 is less than y, which is less than 1.0 equals the probability that 0 minus 1.5 over 2 is less than or equal to y minus mu divided by 0, which is less than or equal to 1 minus 1.5 divided by 2. So that equals the probability that so that's minus 1.5 divided by 2, so it's minus 0.75, less than or equal to z, less than or equal to minus 0 0.25. Okay, um, let's draw a picture. So we're going to be looking for... looking for an interval on the negative side and that's going to equal the corresponding area on the plus side because again symmetry just flipping it over now to calculate this one using the tables what we can get is everything from 0 up to 0.75 and everything from 0 up to 0.25. So we have to subtract that second thing from the first thing to get the area of what's in between the two. So the probability of z being between 0 0.25 and 0 0.75. This time, a little bit uh, different from what we've done before. We do this probability that 0 is less than or equal to 0 0.75 minus the probability that z is between 0 and 0 0.25. So we always have to have it in this form here because that's what our tables come in. So um, that is probability over the whole interval minus the probability over that first interval, and that gives us the remaining interval. Okay, so if you look it up in the tables, this part, first part is 0 0.2734 minus this one is 0 0.0987, and that equals 0 0.1747. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that, but you've got lots of practice in the labs and uh, so good luck with all of that and see you next time